Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the RGM podcast. It's me, Carl Maloney, in my yellow little room here in my, in Shea Maloney, and with a brand new guest, it's Harry Lavin. Hi, mate. You all right? Hi, yeah. Thank you for having me on. You're very welcome, mate. Um, I've seen you, you do interviews on other podcasts and stuff, and I think it was the first time that I heard you, you like, talk about music and that on other podcasts, and I thought, I've got to get him on, because you're, you're one of those opinionated people, aren't you? Yeah, probably too much my own good. Really? Sometimes. How can gets you be? Me a bit, gets me in a bit of hot water sometimes yeah, yeah. On, on the old Twitter, but, you know, <laughs> there's nothing that changing your name for a week can't solve. Uh, <laughs> get away from the trolls, as they say. Yeah, so I've been wanting you as a guest, and thanks for joining us today. You're very welcome in our little berm, little... Uh, zoom world um it's it, it where do i start where do i start with harry so t- t- tell us about your beginning and young harry and how did you get uh, and consider the world of music to be uh somewhere that you want to hang around well it, was all, it all started with um with hip-hop music funnily enough Aye. and i actually remember the first album that actually really struck a chord with me mm. was actually get rich or die trying by 50 cent <laughs> okay because my dad who's now in his 50s yeah. at the time would have been in his 30s and he was going through a bit of a sort of um identity crisis if you will um because in the 80s and 90s he was um, a bit of a rocker right and then he suddenly went through a hip-hop phase in his 30s so that was on in the car a lot i don't think my mum was very happy <laughs> for me to, to for me to be hearing those themes um, yeah. lyrically at that age, but that's what really struck a chord with me. And then uh, friends at school, as you do, you drift off into your different yeah. social groups. And then I ended up really finding I had more in common with the people that were picking up guitars. Mm. Um, that's where that love started. Um, and then obviously went through the sort of process of going through secondary school, joining different bands, um, just trying to write songs, you know, um, spending hours and hours just trying to get good at the guitar. Mm. Um, yeah, and that, that was the beginning, really. Just it was quite a standard. How old, how old were you then? I picked up the guitar about 13. 13. Yeah, and obviously, like a lot of people from around Greater Manchester, um, learning Oasis songs, mm. the Beatles. Um, they are, and, and even, I suppose you could even, you could even say, when you finally get onto like bar chords, then you start learning yeah. the Buzzcocks and the Clash and the Jam. Um, so that was my kind of, my rite of passage. Uh, the hip hop went on the back burner yeah. um, a bit then. But I must no say- bar chords in hip hop, is there? No, but I have, I, you know what I must say, in recent years, I've rekindled my love for hip hop. So, okay. so that, yeah. Um, and then skip a few chapters, lo and behold, I end up um, joining the wheel on bass. And that's yeah. where everything started to get uh, rather exciting after that. Yeah, I can imagine. We'll, we'll park the wheel stories for now. Though. I want to still delve into your past a little bit. So learning the guitar at 13 um was it all beatles and oasis here is that the age you were is, were you 13 ish around when oasis were about is that uh, do you know what, what? the time i picked, was... the time i picked up guitar would have been probably toward right towards the end of oasis okay because i'm 24 now so um in the grand scheme of things in terms of oasis i was relatively late to it um, I remember buying Dig Out Your Soul, which was the last album. And that was that was actually the first Oasis album I actually bought, which was the last one because that was the one that was current. Mm. It came out. So I actually worked backwards. Um, I it think, was one of the worst albums as well. That I've, I've got them I, all. Do you know what? I, I actually, um, I really rate that one. And it's a, it's a favourite of ours. To be where there's life is a great tune on it. It's like quite an Indian vibe. And to be where yeah, there's some there. some George Harrison vibes yeah, in there's there. Some George Harrison's before that, yeah. Um, I, I 
but that album, I liked the direction they were kind of going in. So yeah. it was a shame they split up when they did. Um, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed Don't Believe the Truth as well. Yeah. Um, obviously, the first three albums speak for themselves, but I actually don't think people give them credit for oh, okay. the albums they produced post post millennium. I think you they think were, Chemistry were good. Uh, what else were they? Yeah, yeah. They were standing on the shoulder of giants, which I, shoulder, yeah, I mean one. Gas Panic is just Yeah. That that is um that's a special song that and I don't think those songs get the credit that they, that they deserve really. But um, why, do you, why do you think that is? Um you could probably put it down to there's quite a lot of nostalgia at- attached to bands from the nineties. And I think the bands that were in the nineties still made a lot of good music post the millennium, but because the nineties is seen as such a, like a sort of glorious decade mm-hmm. in the history of music, I think it can be quite easy to forget the great albums that did come out mm-hmm. um, after 2000 and the nineties bands legacy wise suffer from that i think suffer from that sort of misconception that everything that was made in the 90s was the best which a lot of it was but there was still some really good music after that you know supergrass produced some great stuff in mm. the early 2000s uh, manic street preachers did obviously oasis some really good ocean color scenes so, so all them brit pop bands there was still a lot of good stuff um after that and they don't really get appreciated as much because there's not that nostalgia attached to sort of the early 2000s i think yeah well one thing that i've heard people say since moving to manchester is that they are a little bit disappointed that manchester didn't move on music wise quick enough after after the 90s and the manchester scene really do do you have any thoughts on that yeah i think um there, there has been a gen, there was a generation of bands I think that that did try and keep that sort of Brit pop flame going, but I must say that I look I listen to like Radio Six a lot now and you hear bands um, from Manchester. I try to think off the top of my head, but they're more tapped into the spirit of the seventies Manchester mm-hmm. stuff. So you know, like um, Joy Division magazine. And, and that's that's been quite interesting. I think that the people often criticise the way music is now, and they say, "Oh well, there's no there's no real bands to believe in. There's no there's no like next big thing." Yeah. But there's, there's so there is so many good bands, and I think that's why um, I'm so keen, you know, for, for to get get back out there again and just mm. join in with it all. Cause I've been, been on the outside in the last two years and mm. I'm just so keen to get back in the mix again because there's some brilliant bands, some brilliant music being made and it's so diverse. Yeah. And so interesting. Um, that for the first time in my life, I'm probably not listening to hardly any of the old stuff. I'm, I'm listening purely when I'm home to new stuff. Because I feel like I don't want to miss something when it comes out, which is uh, that's the first time I've ever I've ever felt like that really. So that's that's really good, I think. Yeah, yeah, I like the sound of that because you can get and and I've lived in the nineties. I'm I was brought up in the nineties and just it was just my era. I I turned eighteen when Oasis played the first ever arena gig at Sheffield Arena. What, what I went to, two thousand four ish, I think. It might be 2006, something like that. So the, so the, so the my band, and I do feel really protective over them. Um, and I do think they've got a short straw when it comes to people giving them credit for all that music they did over 10, 15 years or whatever. Um, I just find it interesting to see other people's opinion on it, really, because I've banged on about it enough. I just, I just, I, I just think it's a shame that, there's not going to be a final chapter just to finish it off when everybody would see that they are a great band again. Because there's a generation of people that are into Liam Gallagher now while he's doing his solo stuff that are hearing their Oasis songs live, but they're not getting the full Oasis yeah. experience. I must, ad- I must admit, like, um, that, yeah, I, I kind of feel like another chapter would, would be great just because 
Mm. I, I listen to Liam's new material. I think it's great. But I also love some of the stuff Noel's done as well. Mm. Some of the more experimental, really sort of like soundscape type stuff. And I feel that as a creative force, mm. if they were to do something again, it would it would be re- it would be really quite interesting to see the results. I don't think it would be the obvious of what everyone would expect. So I, I do believe mm. they've got a lot more to give in that respect. But like, obviously, you know, seeing Liam many times live, you know, we've been on tour with him, and yeah. it's it's the nearest thing you're gonna get. I mean, it, and now they've they've got Bonehead back in, and mm. the difference that makes as well in just just adding that extra bit of fullness in the sound because the, yeah. the, the thing you can always say about oasis is it's the sound is just full you know it's like well the the, the drummer john the oasis. Gravy. gems in the band he, he were in oasis there's only andy bell that's not there really and noel um and the original uh uh Gwigsy and bowenheads back in the band now so it's 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 close isn't it he's just not quite there yeah, I mean, and, it, and, it, and if it doesn't happen again, then I suppose, you know, um, it's not the end of the world because they are still mm. both at the top of the game, in, in my opinion. You know, I, I believe that they've, they've got a lot to offer and whether that's separately or together, you know, they're yeah. both exceptional at what they do. And um, there's a reason why there's people even younger than me in the teens and whatever that are discovering them and still <clears throat> going to the gigs. Yeah. And it, you, you turn up to the gigs and it's such a diverse range of ages and it must, it's just an amazing thing. It's the, you know, the surpassing generations. Yeah. Well, how, how, old were you, how old were you when you joined Twisted Wheel? 19. 19. So five years ago. Yeah. What was happening five years ago? 2017-ish. So before you were 19, then you were 13, just started playing guitar. What were you doing while between the ages of 13 to 19 then, just before the the the, the wheel started to turn? Um, so we basically started, from school, we started a covers band and um, that had very... What was the name? What was the band name? There was one, it started as... Um, Shattered filter, <laughs> Class. which is yeah. As you you know, we've all got to have a bad <laughs> band name, haven't we? At some part in our lives, shattered then, uh, filter that lasted, uh, and then um, we had a, there was a few things, yeah. uh, and then we did cover gigs around the local pubs, which is mm. is a brilliant education. Yeah, you get that education. Sometimes you'll play to nobody. But we were quite ballsy, you know. We'd turn up as kids, basically, and we'd play half covers and half originals, which if you're going to, like, a pub in the middle of Oldham and you've got a bloke in the corner going, oh, play one we know, yeah. and he's waving his bloody... He's waving his big walking stick in the air and <laughs> he's getting quite rowdy at this point. You know, you've, you've got to be quite brave to do yeah. that. But it was the experience of writing songs and taking them out um, and it felt, you know, when at that age, it feels like you're going on tour. Mm. But all you're doing is just play, you're playing, you know, you're playing the pubs within a 10 mile mm. radius, but you're playing all of them. And uh, that was a great, you know, upbringing. And, and, it, it, and to be honest as well, like, I look back now and I think, you know what, the, the sort of heritage of like pub rock, you know, with Dr. Feel Good and that, mm. there's still a certain appeal. And, you know, the Libertines occasionally just turn up to a pub in Camden, don't they? And, Mm. And it, there's just something about playing in a pub which it's that British rock and roll thing it's like a sort of um, another rite of passage I guess and then we did start a serious band then called um, called Shadow Palace and um, we were like amazing live we were brilliant live um, were you doing bass in that band as well? We no been- that was I was playing rhythm guitar and fronting it in that one. Oh, okay um, so we had Ben Warwick, who's now in Wheel on lead guitar. Mm. So, and then we had um, my cousin Dan Gaunt on bass. Um, he's he's a quality bass player. Will Brooks on drums, who's in a band called Meal Time. 
and he's he's done amazingly well as a session drummer. Um, he gets like millions of views on on his Instagram and TikTok mm. and that, and he gets loads of he's been playing with loads of artists and stuff. So he's absolutely smashed it. And we we were great, but um, it was that classic case of um, we could have done with a manager really um, at the time, just someone with a bit of industry now, just to push us in the right direction because we were we kind of didn't know what we were doing and yeah. we were just would just take any gig even mm. if it wasn't right and um you know and we'd just make all the usual mistakes we'd do some really like cheap recordings at like not very good studios yeah. and, and rush them out not getting mastered rush the artwork not really think about campaigns or press releases or anything like that mm. And um, subsequently, now a, a few years later, I, I've accumulated all the knowledge. So I, 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 if I was to do another band again, I'd know how to do it. It's just mm. at that time we were, you know, we were like seventeen. I was exactly the same when I when I were in Seven Hills and the sound yeah. before that in Sheffield. We just we used to play a couple of times a week in Sheffield, or you know, just midweek. And make all the mistakes that you can, you know, play your city too much, you know, water down your fans because you're playing too much. You know, not everybody can come. You might, you might get five people at all these gigs when you should just do one gig and you might get 30 people to come and see you. And it's just going to be yeah. a better show. L- little, little things like that you pick up through the years, don't you? And I don't, oh, yeah. and like at, at the end of our kind of tenure as playing in Sheffield and you know having a go at being in a band and stuff we supported Twisted Wheel at the plug no way um, before I, your, yeah, I was speaking to Johnny about it um, when I interviewed him uh, a couple of years ago I think now um, and Rick were in the band because I can just remember a really blonde kid in it yeah yeah, um, yeah. and that and well, that was a long long time ago we haven't played for 10 12 years so to to have support a twisted wheel at the plug that many years ago and know that the band's been around that long. It must have been quite intimidating. Well, you tell me what, what was it like joining the band and you know, they've always had a bit of a reputation. How how was it going into that new experience and joining them? Um it was it was fine for me personally because I'd known Johnny for quite a while. Yeah. Um so even when I was like sort of quite young at 18, he only lived around the corner from me. Right. So we always used to, we'd occasionally, you know, we'd go, I'd go up to his, um, he, had, he had like a, a little shed at the end of the garden with like guitars in and a couple of sofas and stuff. And I'd go in there and we'd just like talk about music and, and just jam and stuff. And um, so I was always like a fan of the band. So when I joined the band, I already knew all the songs. Yeah. So like that's just really helpful um, when you join any band. And, uh, and I think when I did join, what gave me confidence was, you know, John knew I wrote songs mm. and he said, you know, I want, I want you to write songs for the band. Um, you know, cause we, we want to like, it's kind of up the ante creatively. So it's not just relying on him mm. to write the songs and showing everyone else. He, he, you know, he wants some more input. And I was obviously delighted to do that. Cause I mean, bass wasn't my natural instrument. Um, I didn't actually have a bass when I joined the band. So I was borrowing, until um, until I bought one, like just second hand off a bloke in Oldham, just yeah. like classic Fender Fender Precision bass, which is the only one I've ever really played. Red and white, um, white and black. Oh, yeah. no, white and black. Yeah. Sorry, the cat's just biting the arm. <laughs> He's, <can> <laughs> He's probably heard the news about that Kurt Zuma thing, and now now I, I saw that bench. on Sky Sports earlier. How mad's that? Uh, my, my wife came in and says, look, have you seen this, Kirst? Is Kurt Zuma's been kicking a cat? And he's like, she's like, what? You are? It can't be. I said, yeah, he's I dropped don't. it and then booted it across. Thing his mates put it on fucking line <laughs> as well. Right, mate. Uh, and now he's in some rate right shit. Oh, I was, I was mortified. I'm on the cat side, cat. by the way. Oh, yeah. No, I was <laughs> as, a, as a cat lover and stuff, and uh, yeah. just an, an animal lover in general, yeah. it, it made me feel really upset. So the first thing I did when I heard the news was I, I ran in and uh, I ran and gave our cat a, like a big hug. Yeah. And just reassured him that we're not all, you know, we're not all like Kurt Zuma. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. I've got two cats myself, Rita and Fernando. Uh, 
Um, absolute nightmare. I wouldn't have them in any other way. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that, that, well. that, that's a yeah, that's a, just a strange thing to. I don't know, but it's like, you know, the, what, I don't know what goes through. I mean, professional footballers at the moment, yeah, they're not, they're not painting, themselves, painting themselves in a good light, really, are they? Um, I'm not saying, obviously, you can't throw them all into one category, but, uh, yeah. you know, everything that's been covered out in the news and stuff, uh, it's just shocking, isn't it? It's just, yeah. you'd wonder what goes on in these people's heads uh, and how, how the brains have morphed into that mindset. I'd love to have him on the podcast. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'd love, I'd love to give him, love to I'd, love to, I'd love to give him a good drilling. That's yeah, for sure. good eye. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, we lost my train of thought there. Cats. Yeah, we've done cats. Yeah, we, we got oh, uh, <laughs> just we got lost a bit there, didn't we? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, it's good though. It's all good. Uh, yeah, um, just joining Wheel um, in Johnny's garage, learning the songs. He wants you to, you know, step up and. You know, he's challenging you to make music in this historic band that you've joined. Were you, were you part of the band when they spotted Oasis or did you join after that? No, I was after that. So the, so the first mm. tour I did was the Snakes and Ladders tour, which was 2018. Mm. Um, and that was a baptism of fire because I'm sure that tour was about 30 dates, mm. um, which is a long... You don't see my band. You don't see many bands doing really long tours these days. Uh, oh, you just bit my foot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it was a baptism of fire that, and then um, I suppose after that, at the end of that tour, then we we supported Liam at Finsbury Park mm. and at Old Trafford. Um, so that was a mad like first year because 2017 we were just building up to things we were just in the rehearsal room um so there weren't really anything going on majorly then um but um yeah 2018 was just a full-on year and it was that mad that we even did a um we even did a second tour so we did that 30 day tour and then we did the um the johnny guitar tour then which Mm. was another like 15 dates or something on top of the ones we'd already done um alongside the festivals we did mm. so that first year was was hellishly full on um and i suppose like you say if you if you're gonna if you're gonna join a band um, and sort of get thrown in the deep end then i suppose that's probably the biggest example you can get how really. did you take to it then so like like a couple of dates into it was it like was it were you okay with it you know did you just take it in your stride how how did you mentally deal with this fucking thing that's happening around you when you're new to it well sir on certain days i'd be like um i'd be like a kid in a sweet shop Mm. um just absolutely loving it and um having a having a good rider you know Mm. actually you know actually Mm. being asked before at all what do you want on the rider like oh well i'll have uh yeah i'll have 12 guinnesses Per gig, that'll do yep. me. <laughs> yep. And uh, by the end of the tour, you'd accumulate quite a few to take home with you. Um, <laughs> but that was good. Um, but the word days, obviously, and it's quite a topsy turvy band in that respect. Yeah. Um, so you know, there were days where it would would be tough. There was a, that first time. I remember there being a few disastrous gigs. Um, specifically Stoke, which I recently got reminded of, um, not intentionally, but I think Johnny posted um, one of his new solo tracks mm. on Instagram and there was, someone posted a really like salty comment mm. saying, um, just for, ran out of the blue randomly saying, oh, what, what a waste of space this guy is or something. Uh, we went to support these in Stoke uh, two, two years ago. And uh, they turned up late, uh, and then they only did like half a set, and then they were just being general, like generally annoying. And uh, and it just reminded me, I was like, oh yeah, that was really bad, that gig. <laughs> and uh, that that was like when Adam was he was on drums at the time. He 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 like left that night, yeah. and then he came back the next day for the for the remainder of that tour, and then he subsequently went on to leave it in that tour anyway, but. We, we were arguing on stage. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's funny how you get these little reminders just occasionally of like, oh yeah, we did actually have some 
bad gigs, amongst all the good things that happened, there was occasionally an absolute stinker thrown in there. So did you, have the, did you have the tour with Liam? Were, were you on the tour with Liam when you joined? Was that like about to happen or did, that, did you find that out after you joined? Um, it was just before, I think, we announced the first headline tour. There was sort of rumblings from Johnny was going like, oh, I think we might have, we might have got on Old Trafford and things we've had for the mm. summer. Mm. And that, when that came to fruition, we were all obviously ecstatic. Um, how how do you physically like? What's the process of finding out that you might be sporting Liam Gallagher in oh, Finsbury Park? What, what what? How's it filter down to the band? How's, how's that happen? Um, no, he, 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 he had a, a good relationship with Liam in the past when he did spot Oasis, didn't he? I suppose. So yeah, they've got that history. As, it was good as well because we do know that Liam like actually fought to have us on because. Mm-hmm. What the trouble we had was there was um, more current bands that were releasing material around the time and doing really well and properly on the up that were vying for those spots mm. and promoters, managers, and what there, there was a lot of there was a lot of people behind the scenes pushing to have these bands on. Mm. But when Liam knew we were coming back with a new EP, which was the Johnny Guitar EP, he. Mm. He, he barely did push personally to have us on and we, like, we'll never forget that. We'll always be like, eternally grateful um, for that. And that made it a bit sweeter as well, I think. That made it just that bit more special just because Wheel had been around about just under 10 years, maybe about 10 years at the time. So to be given that second bite of the cherry was just amazing and amazing for John as well. Cause I think John did deserve, did, did deserve that after yeah. so much trouble. Um, and to come back with that Johnny guitar EP, which we got the number one in the physical charts mm-hmm. and stuff. And it just showed that there was still an appetite for the band and yeah. it still had legs in it. And um, so that, that, that period around the, the EP coming out and old Trafford Finns repart was just, a really special time because it just gave the band a new lease of life and just, you know, it's give us, you know, it's, it's give us a future, you know, creatively a bit of a mm-hmm. sort of pass to go, right, go on now, um, go and make more records, play more gigs. Yeah. Um, and just, just keep going because, you know, um, we're like a slightly less, well, a lot less prolific version of the fall that okay. just, trud- that just trudges on through the shite. You know, we just keep plow, keep plowing on despite all the, the member changes and stuff. Um, well, that, I, don't, good- I don't blame you. And like, you know, when the last time I spoke to Johnny in real life, when we were both in the same room is uh, we were doing an interview and you were just about to go on the European tour with Liam. And at the end of the tour, that's what that tour, well, that's when COVID hit, and you had this album planned and all that kind of stuff. So, let's just start with you know, there's, there's so many things there to unpack a little bit that I've just mentioned in just a little sentence. What just just touring with Liam? What was it like out there? You know, out in Europe playing arenas. What was the environment like? And any stories to tell us from it? Really, look. I think the first thing was we were really well looked after by all the crew. Um, and you know ev- just everything from you know the, the catering um, to the tour management just yeah. everything so we're really grateful for that um, security were always really sound with us kept you know kept us out of arms way and stuff um, I mean in terms of actual big stories I don't think there was too much I mean Eric Cant and I turning up on a right. motorbike to the last gig in Paris was pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm a Liverpool fan, and even I was like looking at him in absolute awe because <laughs> we were just outside the back door, you know, it's getting a bit of fresh air, um, and suddenly this lone man all in leathers turns up at the back gate. Is that just on the back of the arena type thing? Yeah, on the back yeah. of the arena on his own, no escort or anything. Yeah. This is in Paris, and I'm thinking who's this guy? 
who this guy turned up like Batman or something. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and he pulls the helmet off, and lo and behold, it's, it's Eric Cantona. And I'm like, and he just like strolls in. I'm like, yeah. but that's cool. Did he not like, like nod at you, cool. or, or did, did he just like straight past you? Um, acknowledge you in any way I think, at all? I think the other lads got a bit of a picture with him and an autograph because right. they're United fans. I'm right. like, the, okay. I'm like the sole Liverpool fan. I, I'm, to be honest, I'm never one to go for pictures and autographs anyway with with people. I kind of just let. I think the people like that get mithered enough, <laughs> and they don't want like six foot from me like going over to them, like <laughs> tower, towering over them <laughs> and uh, making them feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so no, that was good, but um, yeah, thinking of just general other stories, but. I posted like a, a few little clips on, on my Instagram that are still up there now with just funny little things that happened, like Johnny riding his suitcase down a really long ramp into a straight into the arena <laughs> in a, in Milan and stuff like that. There was no major that I can remember, but I have got the mind of a sieve sometimes. Yeah. So I'm probably I am probably forgetting some some major. Did major Liam incident. never give you any advice? Any any stories about Liam or all like that? Um Liam kind of keeps himself to himself, yeah. um, which I totally respect because I know he gets mithered a lot. Um, mm-hmm. So he'd generally stay in his hotel and then he'd come out in a blacked out van, um, mm-hmm. get on stage and, he, and then come off stage and he'd go back to wherever he was. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, Paul Paul Gallagher really looked after us. Mm-hmm. and uh, I got on really well on a, a couple of episodes ago. I had Paul on. Yeah, um, he, had, he had a few like to say it. He, he, he had proper... a few words to say about me, didn't he? Uh, being a living. Oh yes, man. yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I've just remembered. Um, yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah so he, he, imagine that sort of um, <laughs> imagine, imagine that sort of banter on a daily basis. Uh, you have to be sharp. Oh you know, god! Uh, as soon as I phoned him, he were like having a because I called him Gallagher, and he stresses that it's Gallagher. Straight away, yeah. he's heard him. So straight away, well, he's straight into banter, and he's like, "Take your piss out of Yorkshire and that." And it, it, it just, it was, it was so much fun that interview. I, I, I think he's great. Yeah, he is. He is great. And um, but it's, it's like you know, I wouldn't ex- It wouldn't be within the the northern spirit to <laughs> um to be nice about people, you know. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that's it. Yeah, he did. He, he really looked looks after us and. Uh, the one thing we did have was he'd time us every night mm. just to make sure we weren't going going, going over or under. Ah, oh, okay. Like, you need to plan your set properly. And, yeah. um, so how, how long did you get? It was and like half long? an hour a night, but right. us being us, you know, it, some nights it'd be 28 minutes and then somehow it'd be like 35. Yeah. The, the, next, the next gig. I can remember him telling me because those big gigs they are planned down to the second, aren't they? Oh, they are watertight. And if, yeah. if it's one thing we're not, it's it's, it's, it's absolutely watertight. Um, <laughs> that must have been a new discipline to learn. Then you know, like having to be somewhere at an exact time because somebody's going to be guiding you wherever you like, getting you in the right place and making sure you're on at the exact time so that yeah. you can finish it the right time and stuff. And that's it. And we even tried for the first time ever in ear monitors, which I absolutely hated, mm. and I still hate now because um, I, I I like to I like to feed off the energy on stage, mm. and I feel like you kind of isolate from that with those in ears. Mm. So that was another thing that I tried for the first time. I didn't particularly like it. I mean, those big gigs are amazing. Playing those like mm. arenas and stuff is is pretty special. But where where we'll are probably most at home is you'd probably writ, writ size, mm. not because with the, the smaller stuff, which we play a lot of that around that sort of three, 400 cap on average, most places we're good. We're good in those places, but sort of, I think sort of like writ size is where, mm. where it really works for us. And I don't know if that's always been the case, but if you look at a song like, um, some of the earlier punkier stuff, you know, like, oh, what have you done? Choose a weapon. Mm. They're suited to the really small club type things because they're, they're in that punk spirit. But the newer stuff like DNA um, and Black and Blue um, and Nomad Hat that are quite, quite big anthemic, uh, anthemic sounds, they're really suited to the bigger mm. venues. So the happy medium for us is kind of like your Ritz level. 
but that that it, it's good to play those good to play those arenas because coming cut, being cut from the cloth that we're cut from, mm. you know that not many people are lucky enough to get that opportunity. So, like I say, it's another thing we're just really grateful for to be able to give him the opportunity to do that. And, for, you know, in Johnny's case, the opportunity to be able to do that again after so many years, you know, mm. of not doing it in between the previous stuff with Oasis. So, yeah, it was really good for us just all around. But another, I think, Twisted Wheel must have been one of the biggest hit bands post-COVID because you had the album coming out straight after the European tour with Liam. Literally... I think I, I was in Italy and I got back the weekend when it all started kicking off and got a phone call from work saying, you've been in Italy, have you seen news? And it's all kicking off in Italy, mm-hmm. this COVID thing a couple of years ago. And I, I can just remember seeing uh, Wheel coming back off tour and then you you were due to be on Soccer AM, that got cancelled, yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID. You had so many big things planned to move on to. It must have been it must have been t- a tough time that for, the, for you guys. We built up a lot of resentment to the situation, and I think mm. um, it, it was interesting the way the the sort of narrative changed because when we got back from Italy and Soccer M had been cancelled, mm. and the album was coming out the week before lockdown, or whatever it was, um, it, even even in between getting back off the tour at the end of February and between the album coming out, we still this thing about this virus. We were like. Mm. oh it'll never you know it'll, it'll never uh, you know it'll never come over here it'll never it'll never end up being very serious or anything yeah. and I remember going getting back off the tour and Tucker M got cancelled and Mike Sweeney rang me up and he said do you want to come on the radio and just talk about the tour and mm. and um, Tucker M getting cancelled and what you think about the situation so one of the first questions he asked me was so are the band all in isolation and I went, what do you mean in isolation? I said, I went to, went to the pub like yesterday. Like, what are you on about? Because we were like, what, what, what are you on about? Like, there's, there's no, what crisis, what crisis? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and, no, I, and I suppose when everything did happen, we built up a lot of resentment. Um, I think it hit, it, it, it hit me and Johnny really hard. Um, Johnny, it, from a health, uh, from like a physical and mental health point of view, but me, mentally um i struggled with it and you'll probably know from my twitter and stuff like that um and that's probably my journalistic instincts kicking in because obviously i'm a keen journalist on the side as well that i was kind of trying to question everything Mm. not going down the realm of conspiracy theories but going just saying at the time uh is the road the road we're taking here is it is it proportionate um, and is it the right course of action to take? Mm. And I and I believe really that amongst the kind of musical world, kind of felt a bit alone in that mm. because what, 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 I, found, was, what I, I didn't I can't remember what you put on Twitter yourself there. What were your thoughts at that point? It were just too many restrictions at the time for well when we when we went into lockdown, it was kind of just seen as gospel that that should be the course of action and i didn't say that wasn't the course of action at the time i just said have we fought this through Mm. i don't think enough people were just simply asking that question you know is this the best way and what has frustrated me and it frustrated me throughout the whole thing was there was just a massive gap in between the, the opinions in the music industry so for example, you had Van Morrison and Eric Clapton very much on the sort of semi-cranky sort of, <laughs> like, they had their opinion. But fair enough, they had an opinion and that, that's it. And then on the other side, you know, without naming names, you had a lot of the do-gooders, as I like to call them, that were sort of spending all the time on social media preaching to people how to behave and yeah. what they should do and how they should be following this, that and the other. Um, the reason why my perspective was different to a lot of musicians is because a lot of my other work I do is with um, like young people in deprived areas of Oldham. So I saw the impacts mm. on these families and a lot of my work involves giving them a break from their, the tough conditions that they live in and giving them 
trying to help them back into education and stuff. And a lot of them, you know, they get they get abused off parents and social services are involved and it's just a mess. And yeah. the thing that lock, the side of lockdown that I'd say a lot more of the sort of middle class musicians were, were not seeing was that there was a, in the like, areas such as Oldham, what families and kids were going through was just absolutely atrocious, being stuck in those houses in, you know, in cramped council flats. And for that reason, I had to thought, well, I've got to be quite strong on this because I owe it to the kids that I work with to go at least, you know, write to my MP mm. and just make my feelings clear on it and just try and encourage others as well who felt that way about, you know, there's obviously got to be, with anything, a balanced approach. Um, but I, I still don't think we've reached the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the long-term damage. Mm. And the mental health, um, the mental health sort of, I'll call it an avalanche because it will be an avalanche and it is an yeah. avalanche. And um, so, yeah, that's that's where we were kind of, that's why my mind has been kind of at with things. Um, has, your, has your opinion changed over time? Um, I'm, I'm just, like I say, as a keen sort of journalist on the side, I do like to look quite sort of forensically into things so as I'm, I'm reading the stuff that's coming out now we can start to assess long-term damage and it, it is appearing that a lot of the action that was taken was disproportionate mm. but obviously we've got to wait we've got to wait till more of the social yeah. studies come through and stuff um but but my opinion is we've we've let young people down more than anything um, that's that's going to be the biggest the biggest concern for me. I've working with young people that we it have. used to be a lot of like as soon as schools went back and COVID spiked, there was quite a lot of because my wife's a teacher. Yeah, my yeah. my, my uh, wife to be from next year there uh, is also yeah. a teacher as well. Yeah, they, they always seemed a lot of pressure, and 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 you could kind of feel it bubbling just through the rhetoric of the governments just saying you know before schools were coming back it's kind of a lot of blame was put on kids for spreading it and making things worse mm -hmm. again when the kids they're gonna school um it didn't feel look like you've used the word proportionate mm -hmm. it's an important word and it? It, it didn't feel that the the, the they were, they were blaming kids for the problem. It felt like at some points, and and that that's been a common a common tactic throughout. Mm. It's like gaslighting almost mm. um, the way the way that governments have behaved. Um, you know, it's you know, it's not us that have the problem. You're the problem. Mm. It's you who's got the problem. And I that and I would argue that that people have to have to get by in life. You know, people have to make a living and. Um, we've all had, you know, I've got, I've, I've got vulnerable relatives, mm. you know, who I couldn't go and see, but, you know, there was times when I had to, I had to go and break what were rules to go and help a friend who was, you know, on the edge yeah. and, I'm, and, and, I, and anyone, and, um, and anyone on, there'll be thousands, millions of people in that same situation that had to break these arbitrary yeah. rules to, to just, basically just put the family first and the needs of the family first. And I'll never fault anyone for that. Um, so that, that, that's why I didn't appreciate the lecturing mm. from certain high profile artists, because I was like, you don't know what it's like. You live in a massive house in the country. You've got millions in the bank um, and you're preaching to people about, about sticking to these rules and stuff. I said, some people have no choice but to not stick to them. Some people have got to do what they've got to do. And, and it's not up to millionaire rock stars to be telling people how to behave in, in situations like that. So that's what really got on my nerves from a, in a music world perspective. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I don't think I've ever unfollowed so many people on Twitter than I have done in the last two years because it, it was just getting on my nerves. Yeah. And Ian Brown was getting a lot of stick um, for the opposite stuff. But you got to remember, you know, we live, we do live in this society where it's, 
it's fine to have an opinion and you know free speech is genuinely something that ought to be cherished and if ian brown's opinions offend you then <sighs> prove him wrong debate him don't mm. don't try and get him shut down or cancel him you know if there's opinions that need to be challenged challenge them and if you disagree with them then then be prepared to put your point across and say why you're right and they're wrong and that's what there isn't enough of there's this there's this innate sort of instinct within people to instantly shut down opinions yeah. that they disagree with mm. and we've got to move away from that in music and it just in politics and in society in general it was a, it was a bad time when they uh, banned donald trump off the internet that was you kind opened of like the kind the of worms yeah they opened the kind of worms because i try to censor that, people and you fire up you fire up the supporters mm. you know donald trump was never never the right man to 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 oh. run any country never mind america Oh, absolute shit house, and you know it, it, it is what it is. But you can't stop people having an opinion by no, you know, you sure one media company down. shutting them down. And yeah, and, and it's going on now. It's going on with Jimmy Carr at the minute. It's mm -hmm. going on with Joe Rogan. The the big corporate structures that that aren't able to um restrict or manage some kind of like uh, conversations that are out there in the world. They don't like it. And, yeah, and, and you are seeing these big companies, even, even Joe Rogan, for example, there's more and more shit coming up online. These big companies are, are, are trying to, are trying to break him to cancel him, to, to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to close his voice. And he's got more followers than CNN. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. And, and these big companies have got something, they're scared of these people that have got opinions that have got their own platforms that can't be canceled really. And that's just how it should be. I, I, I applaud things like that. I like that. Yeah, I, I think that the, 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 the idea, you know, behind big tech controlling the narratives of public opinion, mm. that to me is probably the most frightening thing of all. Yeah. Um, because as you can see in the last couple of years, people are very easily manipulated by propaganda. And I've been lucky enough to actually... <clears throat> speak to people in person that actually knew what it was like to live in the Soviet Union. Mm. And the and people don't realise the parallels of, of not of, of sometimes governments, con you know, controlling of the COVID situation, but also how big tech try and influence people through fear. Mm. And there are things for people to be scared about sometimes, but sometimes they play on this idea and it's true that people read headlines mm. and the nuance, the nuance of things is just kind of dug underground. And that's why we're in such a dangerous situation because when you take away debate, nuance debate, and you replace it with sort of this sort of clickbait headline based outrage mm. world then we're heading into some serious territory and there was there was a certain element of that with with the brexit thing going back yeah um you know and I, and i always said at the time you know i i never i don't a lot of people feel really angry towards people who voted for brexit i i absolutely don't at all um because you know people vote on principle at the end of the day and if you want to vote for self-governance that's fine. But the point is that if you use the right marketing and the right and headlines that strike a chord with people, then you will influence mm. hearts and minds. And, um, and I feel like influencing hearts and minds is okay when used for the right purposes, but I don't feel like it has been in the last couple of years. I feel like we're going down a bad path. Yeah, and it, it, it's something to be aware of. We are heavily uh, propaganda too, uh, if yeah. that's the right kind of saying. And even like, like if, if I search something on Google on my computer, you search something on Google on your computer, the same question, it, it could come back with a completely different answer depending on what it knows about you. 
and and Google have got that power to be able to control and send you down a path that you're not aware you've been sent down a path. I am because I'm quite savvy to it, but a lot of people are vulnerable in that way, and they do, and they don't either believe it, or they either don't care, they just don't see it, they just think oh, it's just a Google search. Yeah, it's people take things at face value, mm. and um, it goes back to how people are educated now, being taught being taught what to think rather than how to think. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you go through life and you take everything at face value, not just on the news, but everything you're told off everyone, Mm. even, even on like a personal level, I think sometimes you've got to question people's motives. Um, It's, it's really, it's really important that the, the future of, all education is based around encouraging young people how yeah. how to think. You know, we're trying to nudge everyone in the same direction all the time, trying to create this one grand narrative. And it's it's important to have debate. It's important to have an adversarial environment because nobody learns anything when there's just one grand narrative. Mm. You have to have different perspectives debating each other. And... If we, if we do continue down the path that we're going down, then we're just going to become more and more like these one-state countries, you know, like, you know, like China. Mm. Because people will be so easily manipulated into one belief system that there'll be no, there'll be no even, you know, not even an inkling um, in anyone's minds, you know, like, shall we, you know, is this right? Do we need to resist against this? So I, I do worry, but I do meet young people from the estates of Oldham who are so switched on to this yeah. and they see what's going on and it, it, just, it just fills me with a bit of encouragement. Mm. And the way they've educated themselves is just amazing. It's, it's amazing that they've, they've gone out and they've, they've thought, do you know what, I've not got a lot in life and I want to find out what are the powers that are holding me down? Why, why am I not got a lot in life? And it's, it's, it's a, it is a, it's a beautiful thing. It yeah. is. And do you like, cause I know you've got, you're bringing your own solo music out. Do you, where, do you draw on this experience that you've had helping out <clears> the, <throat> the kids of Oldham? Where do you see the solo project that you've created? Where do you see that taking you? Um, at the moment, it was a lockdown thing. Um, mm. So I've recorded a lot of it at home um, using whatever equipment I could cobble together. And I did, I'd go down to Vibe Studios where we did Satisfying the Ritual um, and I'd get Ben from Wheel to do the drums, Dean had produced, um, I would do the vocals down there as well. Mm. It was a lockdown project and the things I was writing about was just how I was feeling. Um, so the first single that um, that will be out hopefully at the end of February is called Where's Home? And obviously, from a literal point of view, I'm sat at home, so I know where home is <laughs> from a literal point of view. But I was saying it from a metaphorical point of view in terms of the, the environment. Mm. Where's, what you know, because Oldham used to be a great town. Where Where's it gone? You know, you, mm. there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of kids in gangs now. It's culturally deprived. Um, the thriving nightclub scene is is gone. Um, you know, the days of the Inspiral Carpets and, and all of them being in the Premier League and stuff like that. Um, mm. That's gone. So you look round and it's just like, it's an industrial wasteland, uh, post-industrial wasteland. And mm. I think that's the sort of thing I've been drawing on. Mm been thinking a lot about about that and then you know it's it's e- I find it easier to write about stuff like that than than looking too too much internally I know some people like to write about love and relationships and that and maybe as I get a bit older and more mature maybe that will come but I think the solo thing I definitely see it being more of a sort of commentary on the experiences of the of the people around me rather than just myself mm. um 
And in terms of where do I take it then, I've purposely not booked any live dates yet um, because these songs are full band songs, so I don't have yeah. a band together for it. So I'm going to get the first single out and then it'll be followed by another single, then an EP. Um, and then I might think about, see if there's any appetite for it, mm. for people to come and see it live. Okay. Um, and it's not the end of the world. If not, I'm quite happy doing the uh, the Peter Gabriel stay at home sort of recording thing for now, um, and just and just wait till the time's right. You, know? well, you might be too busy because Johnny put a tweet out the other day saying, "Is the wheel turning? Can you comment on that in any way at all?" I can. Um, I can in a certain sense, but we're dealing with a lot of hypotheticals uh, at the book. Right. So okay. We, me and Johnny have been speaking about the band again mm. and um, going meeting him this week, but mm. not really for anything, just to catch up, play a few yeah, guitars, yeah. Mm. have a chat, see if we fancy. So, yeah, um, you know, it'd be nice. I'm, I'm up for it, you know, mm. I'm up for doing it, getting back on, getting back on the train again. Um, so, if it works for the other lads, then why not? You know, let's do it. Let's because we didn't want to. We didn't want to come back during COVID time and have to book yeah. hundred gigs for them all to get cancelled. So we've, uh, <laughs> we've, yeah. you know, we think the right time may may be approaching possibly. So I'm I'm yeah. definitely up for it. If was it? If was it else. Do you, Do you need like a bit of like space and time just to get to know each other again? Did it ever get fractured when things stopped for a bit? Um, I remember at the end of the sort of European tour with Liam, I think but we spend so much time together in a month, mm. a month in a van, you know, you, you will. Oh Christ. I couldn't imagine. No, it had just been murder at the end. I would have thought everybody's like exhausted from all the travel and, you know, the high life. That's it. So you, you, you know, you, you build up a really long, long term, it's really beneficial because you know each other inside out. Mm. You know how to push it. You know you know how to more more importantly how to not push each other's buttons <laughs> okay. going yeah. forward. You know, um, and the, the the amazing thing is, you know, the best bit of teamwork we ever did was getting all them athletic from League Two to the Premier League title on on FIFA that was in. The oh, bag. there you go. So we you know we worked together, passed the remote round. And that is some serious, that is some intense FIFA playing. I can imagine, way. yeah. I've tried it with you know, Sheffield United a few times. That <laughs> it was literally sometimes it'd be like six, six hours constant of just <laughs> going through the Alps, just your like, Joe Royal. Oh yeah, and, you know we had <laughs> managing you know, them up to the top, getting you know getting players in, you know that were just slightly past the best, but you know you know yeah. bit, you know Peter Crouch and uh, <laughs> you know we even got Deli Ali. I think that was pretty oh, good. Ruben Nevers, you know, yeah. so just it, but that sounds really insignificant, but in actually it's really significant because it's another, it's a bond. It yeah. brings the bond, your bond, it brings you closer together, that sort of thing. Um, but at the end, yeah, there was a bit, I think um, there was a bit of tension actually. I remember, do, do you know Stephen Lynn, the artist um, who did our album that. artwork? You might have met him. Um, but we were coming back. Um, it was. It, I think John stayed in France for a bit. But I'm we, better with faces than names. So I'll, uh, yeah. after after our chat, I'll go and check him out. I'm sure, I've, I've seen him. I've, I've probably got him on Facebook or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we had a um, on the way back, getting on the ferry in the van. Uh, I think Steve, Stephen made. I can't remember what the joke was now, but <laughs> it was probably quite distasteful. But I, I probably found it funny because I'm quite into like. You know, non politically correct humor like that. That's my bag. You know, the Harry Harry Enfield and stuff yeah. and all that. That's my uh, sense of humor. Um, but our driver at the time, um, I can't. Do you know, what? I can't remember his bloody name. <laughs> he he took, took, didn't take it well. So it was kind of that sort of mischievous boys thing sat in the back where we're all kind of sat there with our heads down. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it kind of the, the sort of the tour kind of ended with us not where we're all kind of a bit like, oh, we've uh, this is a bit tense. Yeah. Like, so like, you know, Ed, you could say something and someone would just take it the wrong way, and that's just a small example of where yeah. it was going. 
Um, but if COVID had not happened, we'd have brought the album out, probably toured it, but at least we would have had the break in between the European tour yeah. and the you know the UK tour. Um, but we had the break that we didn't want, which was the mm. two-year COVID break. Yeah. So we've we've you know we've spent enough time apart now to let any wounds heal. Not that I think there was any serious wounds, to be honest. Uh, no, just, just a petty little things. Yeah, it's mate thing, isn't it? It's just like a band of brothers. Just you know, just need a bit of time to refine that energy and. Focus again, yeah. I suppose. Is that, is that That's it. the right way of saying it, I think? Yeah, you know, you need... Diplomatic? You need that time. You need that time. It's like in anything, you know. Um, you know, even in your, your close relationships with mm. your friends and your family, you know, you, it's important to have your own time and own space. Yeah. To think, you know, you don't always to be on top of people then you know, and on top of you, you know, you, it, humans need you know peace and quiet time and space um just to just to function and be happy so that's that's what we we've had two years not saying we've all been functioning happy in the last two years Mm. um but it's been nice for me because i've moved into a new house with my fiance we love it you know um you know got the cat and we've done it all up you know so you know life's really good you know, with with yeah. or without, even with or without music, you know, life's really nice. It's really good. You know, we love it here. Um, so, if you're happy in your home life, then I suppose that'll make you more inclined to, you know, be more, you know, get back invested in the other things that you love doing as well. So that's really been helpful for me. Um, and I've calmed down now with the the anger and resentment of the last two years. As much as I still feel mm. angry about it, I. I'm trying now to to refocus yeah. back into more positive positive mindset now. And get back onto the music, refocus, re-energize, get back playing again, and never leaves you the love of music, does it? Whatever you go through in your life, it's yeah. just always going to be there uh, through the good and the bad times. Um, nice little that's way in the chat today. I think there, it's just that's what music does to people, isn't it? You can it never leaves you if it affects you and grabs you. And that's it and yeah. you know it's if if um if i didn't have music in my life i'd be a lot more miserable for it in the mm. sense that you know we all know the power of what it can do it can it can get you out of a hole mentally mm. um you know if you go if i mean i don't go to the gym but people go to the gym you know they, they have motivational music on people put music on to help them sleep yeah um and you know, going to gigs is you know you'll never beat live music. You know, I went to the gym this morning with a Twisted Wheel album on, mate. There you go. What an Dude, hour that was! High energy <laughs> until uh, until the new album came on, and uh, <laughs> there's a few slow ones, few slow ones in there. But yeah, mate, really appreciate your chat and your frank. Uh, just, uh, you know, I knew you were going to be a good guest, and uh, I've really enjoyed, you know, spending this hour with you. Uh, wish you all the best for your solo stuff. Who knows what's going to happen with Wheel? Just watch this space, um, and yeah, just wish you all the best, mate. Oh no, but like, genuinely appreciate you having me on, and good yeah, to see you. I've lived virtually. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah. Cheers, mate. Thank you. <laughs>